It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And worse still, they had a reason, and one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. He shared and in he created their delusion. He said in so many words, quote in a quote, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done, end quote. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. It is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. All right, that's the quote. Dale Allison. No. It was C.L.S. Lewis. <laughs> Better known as C.S. Lewis, but I have replaced him with a seal. Was this guy a Christian? Yes, but respect, respectfully, his answer is terrible. So um, we need to try a bit harder than um, Mr. C.L.S. Lewis to figure this out. So here is what we will be answering tonight. This is the critical narrative. Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet, and I will go through these terms in excruciating detail. Anytime you see the CN over here, that means critical narrative. Eventually, we'll go to MN, which is the Michael narrative. I am Michael, by the way, in case that's not clear. And so the critical narrative, as is on your handout, goes something like this. Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. Jesus thought that he was bringing about the immediate end of the world with certainty. All of that is important. That didn't happen, and as it didn't happen, cognitive dissonance emerged in early Christians who reinterpreted his prophecies and rewrote them, as you find them in the Gospels now, to make them different than they originally were. And um, through the tools of historical criticism, scholars can evacuate Jesus' original message from how the Gospel authors rewrote and redacted it to find his original failed predictions. Conclusion, Christianity is a mistaken doomsday cult and uh, just managed to fail spectacularly upwards. So, now you may ask yourself, what is an apocalyptic prophet? Some of you probably have in mind that an apocalyptic prophet is just anyone who says the world is about to end. This is not so. With, we are talking about an apocalyptic prophet. We are dealing with a very specific deal in Jewish apocalypticism that happened after the Old Testament and before and during the time of the New Testament. So, as most of you all know, there's a big gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is a substantially longer period than the United States has existed. But during that time period, people did not just stop writing. People wrote a substantial amount of works and these works are called apocalyptic works, because that is the um, school of thought that developed. Apocalypse just means revelation. So if you know the last book of the Bible, Revelation, that book's actual just Greek name is Apocalypse. And so this apocalyptic school is, you will notice that none of their works, even though being Jewish, has made it into your Bible insofar as you're a Protestant, can't speak for the Catholics, but um, that is partially because the apocalyptic movement disagreed radically with the prophetic movement, that is the Old Testament prophets on a number of issues. Most notably, the prophetic movement taught that whenever evil happened and bad things happened to the Jews, it was because they were being punished for their sins. But now, after all that's written, the Jews had gotten their act together. They were back where they were supposed to be from the exile, were worshiping one God, they were doing everything right for the first time like ever. And they still got conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans. And so they began to question, what the heck? And out of this became apocalypticism, which said, no, that's not really why it's happening. It's just there are evil forces in this world, 
and it's all really out of our control. And so apocalypticism is very fatalist. They believe heavily in fate. They think it's out of our hands. It's all powers beyond our control, and nothing humans do really is going to affect anything until the end of the world comes. And as you all know from how the word apocalypse has made it into our culture, the end of the world was a very big deal for apocalyptic prophets. So now we may ask, was Jesus apocalyptic? And the answer is a pretty resounding yes. So um, who here knows what um, verse I'm referencing with this image? It was mentioned by Jeshua pretty heavily last year when he gave his presentation. And it might show up again when he comes back in two weeks. I don't know. But here we have Matthew 25 where Jesus says that um, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as shepherds separate the sheep good from the goats bad. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on his left. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And now, where does this concept show up in the Old Testament? Exactly nowhere. But um, where does it show up in apocalyptic literature? Well, in um, First Enoch, not written by any Enoch you know, and all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the world will fall on their faces in his presence and they will worship and set their hope on that son of man and they will supplicate and petition for mercy from him. But the Lord of spirits, God, himself will press them so that they will depart from his presence. You will notice that that is basically word for word the exact same thing in Matthew. And the everlasting fire? Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls we found where people believed this. They said, Accursed without mercy for the darkness of your deeds and sentenced to the gloom of everlasting fire. And that's from the Qumran community. That's written about a uh, hundred years before Christ, and first Enoch is written anywhere from right around the time of Christ to 200 years before Christ. So... There's clearly areas of the New Testament that are directly coming out of Jesus that are straight-up apocalyptic. And aside from that, um, you can just say, Jesus is coming in through 400 years of apocalypticism. He's going to have some apocalyptic tendencies. Not too crazy. So, I'm going to speed up a little to get through the details. Um, let's go into the next point. Did Jesus predict the immediacy of the end? Oh, well, here's one way people try to say this. They'll say, right before the transfiguration, Jesus says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of heaven come with power. And um, this one is used by a lot of people, so I have to mention it, but really this is the worst example they have. Behold, um, this scholar over here, unrelated to this non-scholar over here, <laughs> um, has done a lot of work on this question, most of which I am not in agreement on, so we won't see him much again. But he has shown pretty definitively that um, that specific passage really isn't about the second coming. But other stuff is about this point. And so we have the first commission, which says, yeah, you won't even get through Israel till I'm back. For those of you wondering, we have made it through Israel. And then the Olivet Discourse is where most of this comes from. So the Olivet Discourse is the discourse at the Mount of Olives where Jesus gives his basically final big speech in Jerusalem right in front of the temple before everything goes crazy through the whole week of Passover. And there it goes, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place except there is here a fun little Greek word called genetai, and um, this word gets ignored by 90% of scholars. Every person I've argued on the internet with on this issue has brutally mistranslated this 
and none of them can ever come back when I pull out the Greek and start explaining it to them. So I'm not going to try to explain Greek to y'all, but um, this one passage is much more like easier than people who will translate this as have taken place when that's just not at all what any of our manuscripts are trying to convey. But um, y'all don't really need to know what an aorist subjunctive is. So just take my word on it. So then there's the final point on that issue, certainty. How certain is Jesus that this will happen? Absolutely certain. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. You cannot be more confident in your sayings than to say they will survive the end of the world. And then details. This is what C.S. Lewis built his whole case on, but um, pointing out that day or hour is not known does not get you that week, month, year, century, or millennia are not known. So it's a bit, bit shallow of a case to survive on. So we may ask ourselves, when w can we be confident that Jesus' sayings would have been fulfilled? Critical scholars say, great idea, most apocalyptic literature before Jesus said, end of the world, that's when the temple goes away. And guess what? Forty years after Jesus dies, the temple goes away. And you might be wondering, why am I showing the White House getting blown up by an alien laser? <laughs> well, the answer is because in the movie Independence Day, when an alien laser blows up the White House, the effect that would have on the American psyche is nothing compared to the effect that the destruction of the Second Temple had on the Jewish psyche. For Jews, that is literally where God lives. If the Temple is gone, God is completely cut off from the Jews and has abandoned them. So, even though most critical scholars don't think that Jesus actually knew the Temple was going to be destroyed, they do agree that um, Christians would have connected the dots and sayings like this where um, Jesus says, the temple, you look at over here, it's going to be destroyed. They're probably going to say that that was later invention by Christians, but they're all going to tie. Christians are definitely thinking the world is ending whenever the temple is destroyed. And you can find this idea that the end of the world is going to be at the end of the temple, not only in basically every apocalyptic text that's written 200 years before Jesus or more, but also kind of in Ezekiel. So it is in your Bible. So, on. there is one more issue, though, and this is the conditionality part. Because last time I gave this, I gave like an easy answer. I said, well, there are conditions, so we're good. But a critical scholar might say, hold your horses. As far as I'm concerned, since we know Jesus was an apocalypticist, he wouldn't have actually said there are terms and conditions and all of these rules. So every time you see in the later Gospels parables about it's not happening yet. you got to be ready for delays. You know, stay up all night. You know, you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. It's Mark 13. It, you will, um, it, we have literally huge chunks of later Gospels are just parables about stay around that you don't find in Mark. And so critical scholars look at that and say, ha, huh, that's cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when you believe one thing, you believe another, and they don't match up together, and it starts to mess with you. And they say, that's what's going on over here. And we have many, many cases of that, which I can get into after we're over. Many cases. But then um, there's also specific rules and regulations that you get, even as far as Mark, on what needs to happen for Jesus to come back. Like uh, Mark 13.10 down there, that is... Um, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you will notice that that has not happened. The world has not said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A vast majority of people in the world are not Christian. And so many of the conditions that get preached, like, um, actually, I messed up. 1335 is, um, Blessed he comes in the name of the Lord. 1310 is the gospel must be preached to all nations. And so there's a lot of conditions, big conditions that are not easy to fulfill that show up in there. And critical scholars say, I don't think those are real. 
I think Christians made those up in order to hide the fact that they knew that the end was supposed to come and now it hasn't. And they're just scrambling to come up with a way to get around the fact that everyone knows Jesus thought the world was about to end. So, that's the big problem. Do you all understand the big problem? I've tried to spend like half my presentation explaining the big problem because I think most people going into this don't have any clue how big of a problem this really is. And so I just want to absolutely drill it into your brain that really there isn't a bigger threat internally to Christianity than this. So what are the um, consequences of this? Well, this guy basically accepted the full force of it, was like, yeah, Jesus just made mistakes. You all agreed he was a Christian, so how did he get around it? Well, for one, does the fact Jesus made a false prediction ensure that he did not die and rise? No. Probably the number one defender of this critical narrative today is a Christian scholar, Dale Allison, and um, we read his book in Frontiers. So... Um, Strictly speaking, you can just say, yeah, um, this sucks, but whatever. But um, I don't think that's a really like what you want to go with, especially since we are technically within the realm of evangelical faith, and that's a no-go. So, Because um, there are a couple, couple issues with this. First of all, if you say Jesus made just a straight-up false prophecy... Deuteronomy 18 says, If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. So that would mean that Jesus is taking the Lord's name in vain and is a sinner. And that's not good. And he's probably not God. And that's not good. And consequence two is, y'all are all hoping for a second coming, but it's not going to happen. If Jesus was just wrong about it, you can't expect that there's going to be one. Dale Allison writes, Locating the coming of the Son of Man in the distant future is no more sensible than locating the occasion in the near future. Mythological events do not intersect the historical timeline. The parousia is a parable, a projection of the mythopoetic imagination. Its date cannot be known because it has no date. It's Dale Allison in 2009. And finally, um... One more thing with this guy. He's well known for a trilemma. He says, um, well, Jesus had to be God, had to be true, because if not, you look at what he said, you've got to think he was either a lord, a liar, or a lunatic. And what he says, have you all heard that before? Well, let me tell you about people who say the world's about to end. They are liars and lunatics. So... Um, your ability to apply that C.S. Lewis-style argument with the resurrection, if this is true, has gone completely out the window. So um, this has been why this is a problem and you should be aware of it. And now it is time for me to summarize everything I've told you so that I can get to dispelling your fears. So part one... Um, Around 33 A.D. and before, is when Jesus dies, Jesus says, world ending. For the next 20 years or so, the early church is like, yay, the world's ending. Then, starting in around the 60, um, this is when the emperor Nero starts persecuting Christians to get the, blame them for stuff he did. And um, Christians, for the first time, start to worry about this whole deal. And maybe the Gospel of Mark is written here. Who knows? At 70, the temple goes boom. World does not go boom. Everyone is confused. And then after that, then um, the Christians start coping. They, start, they write the rest of the Gospels. They write Second Peter way later in the second century. Not written by Peter, according to secular scholars. We've gone over that like three times this semester. And... Um, so that, that's, the, that's the timeline. It um, doesn't happen, and then the faith gets built up basically around trying to deal with the fact that it didn't happen. As many, many such cases with other doomsday cults around the world. So um, now I will get into um, saying that's wrong. But before that, 
I open up for some questions about that big old narrative because I figure most of you have been exposed to like at least three words you've never heard before. So if anyone has any questions about any of that, um, I've got a little bit of time, so you can go on ahead. That is exactly correct. So I can see that they do have some opportunity for headway. I wonder what I'm about to say. So um, now let's talk about whether or not the conditionality of Jesus is authentic or, as um, the critical scholars say, nope, couldn't have been authentic to Jesus. And uh, this is all what Caleb was saying. So I have a feeling Caleb might be kind of smart. So, here is my stipulations. Yes, Jesus would have prophesied with conditions. As you can see, we are now in the Michael narrative. And um, I'm going to um, parse out what that means. So, the core issue is, when did the conditionality enter the picture? If, as I am right, it is authentic to Jesus, then the disciples had no cognitive dissonance when it comes to the second coming. The critical narrative is false, and we all leave this room very happy. Yay. If I am wrong, then the Gospels show significant evidence of cognitive dissonance. Critical narrative is right. The Gospels in general are just not historically reliable, and you need to come to frontiers to figure out how Dale says you can still be a Christian. Um, Audrey, you missed your chance to ask a question. We'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs> So now let's talk about prophecy in general. So, um, doo -doo -doo. yeah, so when it comes to how actual prophets prophesied in the world, it's probably a bit different than what you've come to be told. Uh, my mythology professor told us in class the other day, in general, seers are not predicting the future, but explaining the present. So... When it comes to how most prophets prophesy, what they're doing is not saying um, this cow is going to give birth on a Tuesday. And everyone goes, wow, it gave birth on a Tuesday. No, what they're saying is um, you are all evil. You are all going to die. There's going to be a tornado. We will kill you all. Repent so you do not die from a tornado. And they repent and no tornado comes. And then, like, he said there would be a tornado, but there wasn't. But everyone's happy because there wasn't a tornado that killed them. And so this is how most prophecies go. It doesn't make for good novels, and it doesn't make for good Greek tragedies. So you've probably, most of your experience with ancient prophecy has been Greek tragedy, which, by the rule of Chekhov's gun, you kind of have to have your prophecy pay off sometime in your story. People in the ancient world didn't want prophecies to pay off. And it's just implicit in a prophecy that when someone says something's going to happen, it's not set in stone, and you either have to work hard to make it happen or make it hard to make it not happen. So, um, do I have anything more to say? Yeah. Say what I just said. So, um, there's a guy in the Netherlands... That's not actually how you say it. My sister knows how to say the Netherlands in Dutch, but I do not because I'm bad at Dutch. Um, his name is Matthew de Jong, and he has pointed out that um, if the predicted outcome was successfully averted, this did not make the prophecy false. On the contrary, a prophecy protected by society by revealing a threatening disaster, and they were doing a good job in doing so. So, um, there's the source. Here is how conditional roots work for prophecies. 
These might be vaguely familiar to some of you, especially those who spoke out in Julie's meeting, because you can find this pattern in a certain prophet with a very memorable passage that is quoted a lot by Christians today, it's specifically the part where Paul quotes this passage. This is when Jeremiah says, Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. O house of Israel, if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I declare a nation that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do for it. I skipped out some words in there, but that's Jeremiah 18, 6 through 10. And so we have two paths. It seemed pretty straightforward. The prophet says, bad thing will happen. People repent. Bad thing does not happen. Prophet says, good thing will happen. People sin. Prophecy is delayed. Though when a prophecy is delayed, that does not mean it will never happen. It just means it has been delayed until they stop sinning. And that is very important. So, I hope that makes some intuitive sense to people. But it does not make sense to apocalyptics. They say that's ridiculous. Most of them. As I said, apocalypticism was fatalistic. What they said was that no way could our sin delay the coming of God because God doesn't really care what we do. And I'll read from you. This is from 4 Ezra. You will notice in your Bible you do not have 4 Ezras. This is because this Ezra was not the Ezra of the Bible. It was not Ezra at all. This is a guy writing about the time of the Gospels and writing probably in response to the temple because obviously when the temple exploded, all the Jews were like, what the heck, the world is ending, and they needed answers. And so in 4 Ezra, Ezra says to the Lord, O Lord, that bearest rule, even we who are full of impiety, and for our sakes, peradventure, I really don't know why the guy who translated this felt like to use the word peradventure, but it is that the floors of the righteous are not filled because of the sins who dwell on the earth. And God answered, Go thy way to a woman with child and ask of her when she hath fulfilled her nine months, if her womb may keep the birth any longer within her. Which is a wild way to say, um, no, you're wrong. Nothing you do can change how I am going to act. And so um, that's, uh, that's what um, the apocalyptic texts tell us of what was going on with uh, for Ezra. Now, one interesting thing to take from that is if apocalypticists are so adamant that um, prophecy is completely fatalist, why do they need to be arguing against the idea that it's conditional this late in the history of apocalypticism? You probably didn't have that question in your head because I wouldn't have, I did not make it something that was going to be obvious for it to go into your head, so I can't really blame you for not thinking that. But that is a good question that some of you might have had, and if you did have, that's pretty cool. But now, because I've mentioned it, you all have it. So here is my butt. Um, so conditional apocalyptic literature um, did exist. The issue was it was a fringe minority in apocalyptic literature and was just straight out inconsistent with the fatalist parts of apocalyptic literature. But we're okay with that because we don't think apocalyptic literature is inspired and it's okay for them to make completely confused and inconsistent views. So Dale says, despite the historical determinism which undoubtedly characterizes much apocalyptic literature, there is nevertheless a good many apocalyptic texts in which it is undoubtedly taught that the eschatological, that means end times, climax is contingent upon or at least will be hastened by the repentance of Israel. That the juxtaposition of these two convictions involves a real contradiction, we do not need to doubt. That's Dale in 1985. So, we can say, yes, Jesus was apocalyptic. But now we have a little fail-safe. The scholar move from apocalyptic to therefore couldn't have made a contingent prophecy 
has gotten sufficiently weak for us to now ask, well, um, how did the Old Testament work? And if Jesus, who we usually associate with the Old Testament, since we put his book in the same Bible as the Old Testament, maybe they kind of agreed on some stuff. So, what's going on over here? Oh, what do you know? We have a big fish, a chaos dragon devouring Jonah. <laughs> you know, so, um, who here um, knows the story of... Um, Jonah and the big seal. Seal is just as accurate a translation as whale is. So um, I will stick to it. Um, how, how does that go? Does um, God say, um, tell Nineveh it will be destroyed, and 40 days later Nineveh gets destroyed? No. No. What happens is he says, go tell Nineveh 40 days and you'll be destroyed. And Jonah says, I'm not going to do that. If I do that, Nineveh won't get destroyed. And now that's a bit of a silly idea, isn't it? You tell them one thing, but you telling them one thing ensures that the opposite will happen? How does that work? Pretty simple. It's a conditional prophecy. If he prophesies to Nineveh, you will be destroyed. Never once does the prophecy that Jonah is given have any conditions in it. Jonah's prophecy is just 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. But what the book of Jonah tells us is the Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on a sackcloth. This is Jonah 3, 4 through 5. And in verse 10, God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, so he relented, and he did not bring on them the destruction he threatened. And what does Jonah say? Does Jonah say, wait a minute, I said they would be destroyed. No, what Jonah says is, this is why I tried to get away. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. This is the funniest book of the Bible, and if you're not reading it like that, you are reading it wrong. This book rocks. This is literally, he goes, I was trying to stop you <laughs> in verse, like, one. Um, yeah, this is just chapter four. But there are some people who um, are uh, in Utah, and they say um, <laughs> that... Um, <laughs> that, you no, know, Jonah is a determinist prophet, and God just completely changed his mind. It was a determinist prophecy. I don't see how you can get that out of the text unless you are putting all of your dogma in front of the data, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now let's, um, now that I've gone over a story that you're all well familiar with, let's go over a story that you're probably not well familiar with. I skip a slide. Nope, they just go straight into this big old chart. So, there was this guy. His name was Jerry. He lived from about here to about here. And Jerry made a prophecy. He said, things are about to get really bad. Notice the temple getting destroyed. But don't worry about it. In 70 years, everything will be fine. That's Jeremiah 29, 10, heavily paraphrased. And then what does Zechariah say? Zechariah, who did not make it onto this chart, I guess he's not cool enough, Zechariah's talking around here at the 68-year mark, and he says, it's happening, guys. He says, the angel of the Lord says, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? And a couple lines later, the Lord says, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Israel. Now, notice up here, we have Queen Esther. So, a question to y'all. If the exit, or not the exodus, the exile, two different things. If the exile ends around this point, why is she still in the Persian Empire and not in Jerusalem? No, it is not... I don't think that's the case. The answer is because the exile did not end. 
So, really, if we want to get Christian theological and throw our theology into the text, it did not end until Palm Sunday when Jesus marches in and declares that he is, God has returned to Jerusalem because he's back. But um, historical critical scholars are not going to like that answer. So we can say um, that it persisted for at least um, another 150 years. Or 150 years total. Because we have our boy um, Ezra. You all have heard of Ezra. He's got... This is the real one, not the fourth one. Also called two Ezdras. That's another name for the books. They couldn't figure out which Ezra he was. Both of them was the wrong Ezra. But um, in 130 years later, Ezra leads the first expedition to rehabitate Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a shell of a city. Ten years later, Nehemiah goes to do it because Ezra's expedition was largely unsuccessful. So... Um, that didn't work out. Can anyone guess why it took them so long to get back? It was delayed because of sin. And now I can explain to y'all in pretty good detail through Ezra and Nehemiah, because they give it to us in good detail why it was delayed, but I think it'll suffice to say, um, don't sell your kids into slavery. After this topic, I can go through everything with y'all and start talking about like all the cool side quests God's doing in Esther, but um, I think this is good for now. So, um, let us uh, mention this, though. So, you might have noticed in the little graph I showed earlier, I had other stuff highlighted on the bottom where the temple gets started and finished around 72 years after Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, I don't know if y'all believe in rounding errors, but um, that's 70 years to me. So, what we get from the uh, Zechariah, the Chronicler, Ezra, and Nehemiah is not the prophecy is completely failed, everything sucks. What we get is, um, yeah, um, the prophecy was only partially fulfilled, but it was partially fulfilled on time. That's a good thing. Everyone should be happy when there is at least partial fulfillment, because what does a partial fulfillment show in a delay? That God is still with you. And so that is something which they all rejoice about. And frankly, this is right on time in my book. And if you go on Wikipedia and ask how long the exile lasted, it'll be like, 70 years, because this happened, and that's, like, good enough for most people. So, partial fulfillment is real, guys, and it will be important. So, let us, um, let's tie this back um, to the guy you all came here to talk about. So, I have here a very long quote from the book that I've told you I'm getting my sources from, which goes into excruciating detail on how much of Jeremiah you can find in Jesus' prophecies about the Perusia. I will only read y'all a third of it. Buckle up. Jesus' denunciation of the temple establishment is paralleled by, and indeed modeled on, Jeremiah's temple sermons, which is Jeremiah 7 and 26. Moreover, when cleansing the temple, Jesus explicitly cites the first of Jeremiah's temple sermons, Jeremiah 7, 11, in Matthew 21, 13, slash Mark 11, 17, slash Luke 19, 46. Synoptics be like that, you know? If you don't know what a synoptic is, it's those three Gospels, because they copy each other. Da, 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 da. Jesus' invectives against the scribes and Pharisees are conjoined with a lament over Jerusalem, the common element between the denunciation being that all parties are indicted for killing the prophets sent to them. The passage is significant. I'm not going to even tell you all of the verses that are quoted in that section. The passage is significant insofar as Matthew's phraseology evokes the second of Jeremiah's temple sermons, Jeremiah 26 and Jeremiah 22 in which Jeremiah is about to be put to death by the temple leaders and warns them that they will be bringing innocent blood upon yourselves and their cities. 
Even more intriguing is the fact that precisely the same paragraph, Jeremiah 26, 12 through 15, delineates the explicitly conditional nature of Jeremiah's prophecy of temple destruction. Quote, Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will change his mind about the disaster he has pronounced against you. Jeremiah 26, 13. So, to summarize all of that, Jeremiah's speech was overwhelmingly conditional. Jesus' speeches, in which he is actually giving explicit prophecy about the second coming, they do have parts that are apocalyptic. We cannot deny that. Matthew has a bunch of stuff about earthquakes and famines. That is super apocalyptic. That is completely apocalyptic. But at the same time, there is overwhelming Jeremiah everywhere, quoting Jeremiah everywhere, and Jeremiah is super apoco not apocalyptic. Jeremiah is the least apocalyptic prophet in the entire Bible, insofar as apocalyptic is defined as fatalist. Therefore, my um, hasty conclusion is um, we have no reason to think that the critical scholars are correct when they do what we can call the Caleb derivation of Jesus was apocalyptic, therefore there's no way any of this conditionality in Jesus is true, when I think I have shown that not only should we just expect conditionality, since that's normal outside of apocalypticism, it's present in apocalypticism, and it's present in Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is present in the words of Jesus, especially the ones he's literally saying. So, I'd say the early edition model of the conditionality being authentic to Jesus we have very good reason to believe it, and this can undercut any argument about Jesus being a failed prophet. And so, can buttress this with going actually back to the New Testament now and seeing, all right, where are the partial fulfillments that we got in the New Testament? Most obvious is going to be down here, destruction of the temple. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed. It was. And um, this is the exact same type deal we get in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says the temple will be rebuilt. And it was. But that's the first part that happens in the total prophecy of Jeremiah. We also get Jesus gets resurrected. That's a pretty big deal. I don't know if you know this. That's a really, it's not a lot of people get resurrected, guys. We have a whole, like, four books about how he got resurrected. It's, like, pretty impressive. Literally, right before one of the statements that Jesus makes, the one that I said wasn't actually apocalyptic, he becomes glowing and starts hanging out with Moses and Elijah. That's, like, pretty cool. And then, where are we now? The church. We are the biggest religion in the world. We grow constantly and rapidly. There is some reason to think that um, the God has not forsaken us, you know. And so, you'll notice that compared to, like, other apocalyptic groups, just in, like, the general term, these are, for the most part, not, like, mysterianizing and wooifying, like, all of Jesus' pro predictions. This is not saying, well, um, it happened in heaven, or... There were aliens coming, but the aliens have left. This is like stuff people can actually just go out and see, and this is people saw with their own eyes. There is like a difference there. But um, my remaining few minutes, I would like to um, go out and um, tell you how this affects your own life and why you should actually, like, care. So, um, let's see... Uh, this is just, um, yeah, this isn't the Michael narrative. This is just the Great Commission. So um, here we have Peter. He was a fisherman, so he fishes for seals. <laughs> so in Second Peter, we get a much happier view of the delay and what it means for us. And I'm going to paraphrase the entirety of Chapter 3 of Second Peter, which is the last chapter. But do not forget this, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, 
but everyone to come to repentance. Da, 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 da. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. So what Peter is saying there is two important things. The fact that we are in a delay does not necessarily just mean this is all bad. If there was no delay, there would be none of us. There are more people going to enter the body of Christ due to this delay than would have otherwise happened. This delay, God is allowing this delay in part so that we can have an active role in speeding it up. How long this delay lasts due to the conditional nature of the prophecy is based on how quickly we fulfill the conditions. Like I explained to you earlier, the conditions in Mark of we must preach the gospel to all nations and all the nations must say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, this is my call to action, you know. Go out, evangelize. Only you can immunitize the eschaton. <laughs> that means bring about the end times. So, as C.A. Strine, one of the other authors in the book, said, predictive prophecy is an invitation to affect divine action. So, that's pretty cool. Most of you all probably don't think through your day-to-day -day life that what you're doing will actually change how God acts in the world. But this is how it works. So, this is my invitation to all of you all. Go out preach the gospel to all the nations and bring about Jesus' prophecies. His prophecies have not failed. We are still working on them. So, got me a bajillion um, takeaways, but the main points are conditionality comes from Jesus. It's not later redactors. These have been partially fulfilled. And the partial fulfillment was mostly foreseeable for those immediate followers of Jesus, but his final, covenant, his final coming will be of great significance to all people. And do not be a person going out and calculating the days and saying he's going to come in 2012 sometime between August and the next June. Don't be one of those people. That's not how it works. It's not set in stone. It hasn't been set in advance. You can't calculate it from looking at the book of Daniel. The only way for you to go around, I know when the parousia is going to happen, is if you are actively bringing it out. And so um, I have one last quote to provide from the book, which is like the last pages of the book, and then I will open up to questions because I like this quote. One cannot lose sight of the undeniable biblical and Christian conviction that the final arbiter of history's perpetuation and climax is God himself. It is God's sovereignty that extends humanity more time, that births new generations of people to love and serve him, that is present in sustaining the faith and progress of the church. It remains God's alone who will decree humanity's consummation. Only God decides how human actions will impact upon the fulfillment of prophecy. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. God alone knows when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Romans 11. Only the Father knows the hour and the day. Matthew 24, Mark 13, 32 through 33. For all that humans can do to hasten the day or to obstruct our reception of eschatological beatitude, the coming of the end times, only God can finally put an end to all of our wonderings. It is for this reason that the scriptures implore, Come, Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 16, Revelation 22, 20. Likewise, this is why the second petition of the Lord's prayer is, Your kingdom come. Outside of that, um, that phrase is meant to be an imperative. It is a demand in the Greek. It's not like a, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It is a plea. Back to the quote. Ultimately, God must act, must choose to, cho 
to come again in Christ. It is because God is committed not just to react to humans, but rather to cooperate with us that we have hope that He might come soon. Were it not for God's commitment to bring His work to completion, the moral contingency of the prophesied parousia might be a crushing burden instead of a consolation. However, much... That was not a comma there. However much our flickering moral lights can illuminate this present darkness through the help of the Spirit, the darkness shall only be finally expelled by the Lamb who is the lamp of the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints. Amen. And uh, that is my presentation. Here is everything I did not say. So in our last few minutes, you can ask me questions. And um, all of this stuff is really important to whether or not any of my case is true. And so if you have questions about any of this, it's probably better to do them at the uh, Chick-fil-A because I have slides on like all of this. But are there any other questions, people? So, if, if you don't have explicit conditions given, like, alongside the prophecy... Doesn't matter. I see it in Jonah. Well, so, like, I guess, how exactly do you know by looking at a prophecy whether or not it's um, conditional or unconditional? Um, it's conditional unless shown otherwise, because that's how all prophecy works basically unless you have a, a really good reason to think a prophecy isn't conditional that's how prophecy works in basically every culture and that's just the default that's the strong default state of a prophecy so you need really good reason to think that a prophecy isn't conditional such as it's in a play or something for you to conclude that it's a fatalist. So does that make the prophecies like unfalsifiable and that where you could always come up with another explanation of why it's been delayed? Because isn't one of the pieces of evidence for Jesus like that all these prophecies seem true, but you could always just push that down the line? Uh, well, we do do that. We, we have a bunch of prophecies about what the Messiah will do that Jesus has not done. And we are just like, yeah, he'll do it when he comes back. And so insofar as you want to use these as like an argument for Jesus, it's probably going to be unsuccessful for that reason, because you can always point to, there's a lot of prophecies that are like, yeah, Jesus has fulfilled, but the base rate of total prophecies to be fulfilled, a lot of them haven't been fulfilled yet, so that's not exactly my favorite argument for um, Jesus' divinity, but when it comes to the, just the general claim of do prophecies, as long as they're fitting like the same um, general path, you can see areas in which it doesn't match up. So say, uh, this is kind of what the apocalyptic prophets thought was going on and why they started. They thought, we have repented, we are back at our temple from the exile and stuff, so things should be good, but then things weren't good, and therefore they concluded the prophecies were wrong or being misread. So if you have a formula of repent or be destroyed and they don't repent and they're not destroyed, probably the prophecy was wrong. But it's not a like, people want prophecy to be fatalist because that's easier to tell if it's true or not. But since it's just, a, it's just a part of how prophecy works that it's meant to depend on how the people actually react to it, it's just not going to be something which is like strictly falsifiable. Take one more question, and it's 9.30, so we kind of want to get out of here. Um, I want to understand a little bit more about the critical narrative and why you think it's such a problem that, as an apocalyptic pro prophet, Jesus shouldn't uh, have a lot of conditional prophecies. It seems to me that if you're a prophet, if Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet, if some apocalyptic prophets are known to they're a prophet first, and the apocalypticism comes on second, on top of basically their prophetness. So that if they ever drop the apocalypticism, there's always the inherent 
Chris Sofa. But it seems there's a lot of the struggle in the scholarship is that really all apocalyptic prophets speak as apocalyptic prophets all the time. I mean, yeah. Like, we can start getting into the weeds of apocalyptic literature back there, but it's not like it's a toss-up if it's going to be conditional or not. It's like a 90-10, probably worse than that, like 98 to 2%. Apocalypticism is, in general, super fatalistic. So um, that there is definitely unequivocal conditionality in some apocalyptics, and there's definitely like a minority undercurrent insofar as we are accepting Jesus as like a, pr a normal apocalyptic scholar. It would be really, really weird for Jesus. If we had like no Jeremianic notes from Jesus, it would be really implausible to say that the conditionality was from Jesus. All right. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Michael. So we're going to go straight out this door and around the corner to the Chick-fil-A, one of those tables there, and uh, we'll hang out and talk about this issue or anything else, or as long as you want to stay.